Hello, lovely people. Today, we are going to be delving into a secret language. Ooh, secrets! Specifically, a language that was spoken across the LGBTQ plus community, primarily by gay men. That's right, a gay language. Is there a Duolingo course I can take this in? I, I don't, I don't actually have an advert to insert here. Merch, I make merch. Adorable enamel pins and cute greeting cards. And every time you buy it, you're supporting me and my plant buying addiction. Also the baby we're about to have. Uh, but for some reason, my wife's pregnant lady nesting instinct is focused very much on making sure our newborn has a lovely garden to spend time in because we are still in a pandemic and I personally am kind of frightened at the thought of taking the baby out into the bubble of our house uh, out of it uh, for the first three months so um so we're really going to be using that garden insert footage here Thank you to everyone who has bought some merch and thus helped give the baby a plant. Or who has become a member of the Calgary Fairies Love Club because you will eventually be my maternity leave for two months and I love you. But enough about lesbians making babies. Polari. Polari is the special LGBTQ plus language we are going to be talking about today. Interestingly, it has been scarcely researched, largely because it was a language that wasn't ever formally written down. It is, however, a very important part of LGBTQ plus history in the UK, and thankfully, linguistic expert Paul Baker has dedicated a significant amount of his research into the language. He's written a number of books on language and sexuality, including Polari, The Lost Language of Gay Men, and Fantabulosa, A Dictionary of Polari and Gay slang. That's right, the word fantabulous is actually a Polari word, where fantastic and fabulous were mashed together for the first time. I will link Baker's resources in the description below so you can read more. An overview of Polari. As a language, Polari was primarily used across cities in the UK in the 20th century. It was spoken by vulnerable groups as a form of protection, where they could communicate without fear of being, you know, discriminated against by groups higher up in the social hierarchy. When homosexuality was still a punishable crime and heavily frowned upon in society, the Polari language opened the door for gay men to speak freely about topics that would uh, otherwise have revealed their sexuality. They could talk about holding hands with a man without handing a two-year prison sentence. <laughs> Such freedom. Polari acted as the shield against mainstream heterosexual culture at a time when there was a very real threat of imprisonment, as well as violence and ostracization from normal society. Because of this, it's actually considered an anti-language, a language that's spoken by people on peripheries of society, born out of rebellion against the mainstream, and spoken only by people in a minority community. It was a sort of secret code that was not only allowed you to speak freely on topics deemed taboo at the time, but also to identify others in your community without explicitly saying, hello, are you gay? But just slightly uh, less subtle. Again, let's not forget how difficult it was to be queer in the UK in the mid 20th century. Homosexuality was still considered a mental illness by the medical profession. LGBTQ plus members were sent to conversion therapy to be cured, and I have a, a whole video on that here. And the media was vehemently against us. In 1952, the Sunday Pictorial published a number of articles titled Evil Men, writing that homosexuality was a spreading fungus. Very accurate. Cover us in antibiotic cream and the gayness will disappear. In 1963, the Sunday Mirror wrote an article called How to Spot a Possible Homo. Again, extremely useful. It's like a fun guide you'd be given on a safari. Handy for the singles amongst us too. So, you can understand why LGBTQ plus folk were in desperate need Need of a way to communicate without revealing their true identities. Origins of Polari. The word Polari itself can be derived from the Italian Polare, meaning to speak. In fact, many Polari words sound Italian. For example, the number two in Italian is due. In Polari, it is pronounced due. Also, the common English word scarpa was originally a Polari word, which came from the Italian scappare, meaning to run away. Bene, excelente. Look, it's my Italian knowledge. It's pretty limited, okay? Despite my mother speaking it fluently. I mean, my parents also speak French and German, but my brother and I only speak dyslexic, so I try. The reason for this Italian origin is because Polari can be traced back to the Mediterranean. So linguistics kind of argue over its true origins, but roots have certainly been found in the language Pagliare. This was a slang dialect from the 1800s that was typically used by sailors, buskers, and fairground workers across the Mediterranean. 
And I was really hoping that this was going to come back to gay pirates, but that's just a maybe, so someone please write a research paper. Speaking different languages, they needed a way to communicate with each other, and so slang dialect Paliare was born. It's the travelling nature of these people's lives that inspired a fusion of dialects and waves of communication to grow that eventually resulted in Polari. Once Paliare made its way over to Britain, it then merged with other linguistic sources to become Polari. So it took parts of Cockney rhyming slang, French Yiddish, American Airful slang, and even backward slang, where you pronounce everything backwards. Era organized site or diff dyslexics, let me know in the comments if you're one of the weird ones like me whose brain just immediately reads that with ease because that is the skill it decided it needed. Being able to spell Wednesday? No, Jessica, will bin that. Reading things backwards? Apparently vital. Polari is just a real mismatch of these anti-languages and slang. It's slang from thieves, fishmongers, travelling circus performers, sex workers, and in particular, theatre people. It is believed that Polari primarily grew out of the entertainment world. It was the language of the theatre, working its way around the West End music halls, the dance companies, and circus groups. How was it learned? So, how did people learn Polari? Well, it wasn't a language taught or written down to people to study, it was just passed around orally, which meant it took a variety of forms and pronunciations. The language was written with camp sarcasm, irony, and innuendo, and most people who picked it up had a very small vocabulary, primarily for describing people and their appearance and sexuality, often in a pretty catty way. There were, however, speakers who could hold a full conversation in Polari, chatting about escapades of the night before, or gossiping about the style or etiquette of another gay man, without fear of recognition by police. For example, someone might say, he's been trolling about fiddling with his basket. This means he's been walking around touching his downstairs area. I feel like we all could have guessed that one. Men who'd been in the gay scene for a while would typically be the ones to teach Polari vocabulary to the new kids on the block. They would often give the newbies their own camp nicknames too, which sort of acted as an initiation into gay subculture. For example, research found one man called Nathan being given the nickname Nanette. So, Walter, hello, how are you doing? So, uh, your nickname is now Waltet. Yes, yes it is. Often some of the nicknames weren't so nice. There have been stories told that if you were a particularly attractive man, you'd be given a not so nice nickname to push your ego down a bit. So you're just very handsome, Walter, which is why we had to give you a silly nickname. Otherwise the other dogs just feel bad. I knew you'd understand. See, I knew you would. Translations. All right, time for me to actually teach you some Polari. Like I know. The most common phrase in Polari is Bona tavadi or dolly oldik. Bona means good, Veda means see, Dolly means pretty and eek means face. So a little translation is good to see your pretty face. But generally it was used just a way of saying nice to see you. Dolly came from the Cockney rhyming slang and eek is short for ekaf, which is face backwards, obviously. See, it's like a fun puzzle. Speaking of Dolly eeks, here's a, a photo of my beautiful, beautiful wife. You can see more of her Dolly eek over on our Instagram at Jessie and Claude. Let's learn some more words. So the word for man was omi and legs were lallies. So if you see a great pair of legs on a man, you might say, look at the lallies on that omi. I think we should test some of my Polari on Claude, so. Claudio, can I ask you something? Can I troll around your latte? Excuse me? It means can I have a look around your house? Sure, it's your house too. Yeah, I know that. And we just had a lot of building work on it, which I documented on my Instagram, so you can have a troll around our latte yourself at Add Jessica Out of the Closet. There were also a lot of different names used for the police in Polari, mainly because the police were the greatest threat to the LGBTQ plus community at the time. In 1921, 178 homosexual offences were recorded in the UK, but by 1963 that number had significantly increased to 2,437. Arresting gay men was just seen as an easy arrest for policemen, and it allowed them to prove that they were doing such a great job of sustaining the UK's high moral standards by punishing this shocking behaviour. Oh, such heroes! Much safe. There were even stories of policemen just luring men into engaging in sexual activity, only to arrest them as soon as they did. So, so as a way for Polari speakers to insult their enemy, they, okay, unfortunately, uh, rather sexistly, adopted female identities for them. They called the police Betty Bracelets, Hilda Handcuffs, Lily Law, and Jennifer Justice, to name a few. I think it's cute. Uh, I think we should add, like, Jessica Jail, Claudia Clink to the mix. I mean, those were a bit on the nose, but... 
Add your own in the comments below. Mainstream heterosexual society hadn't come up with words to explain variation within LGBTQ plus communities, because you know, our existence wasn't legal, so we didn't deserve to have words. Similarly, Pallavi replaced mainstream words that were perceived as derogatory. For example, the word homosexual was a more formal word used for medical and legal sectors, both of which were discriminatory towards gay people, and as such, to reclaim their identity, new words for homosexual were born, such as queens or omipolones, which literally translates to men women. There were also words in Polari that have made their way into mainstream English vocabulary today. For example, the word zhuzh, as in zhuzhing my hair, which I'll be honest, I use all the time actually, comes from the Polari word to style up. So yes, I am zhuzhing. Also, dish in Polari is either buttocks, remember that one for later in the video, or an attractive man, paving the way for describing an aesthetically pleasing individual in English as dishy. It's also been argued that the word drag may have originated from the Polari language, which was commonly used as a way to describe women's clothes. Drag. So drag queens in particular were known to speak frequently in Polari. Lee Sutton, for example, was a hugely popular drag queen and singer in the 60s who would sing comedy songs in the language. When he then explained to non-Polari speaking audiences what the translation of his lyrics was, he would often purposely translate it wrong to give the Polari speakers in the room a cheeky extra little joke. Problems with Polari. Ah, uh, yeah. So the language uh, wasn't always used in the kindest of ways. Whilst it provided a means for underrepresented groups to communicate, those conversations were often rather snarky or had a level of nastiness. For example, racist terminology found its way into the language. It's important to remember the backdrop of when this language was being used. In the first two thirds of the 20th century, attitudes towards race were particularly hostile, even within the LGBTQ community. As such, racist words found themselves themselves in the Polari language, where specific words were formed to describe black people. In addition, because the language is rooted in hiding one's sexuality, vocabulary is often associated with appearances or sex, which means it was used to objectify others, mock their appearance, or gossip about their sexuality or their prowess or lack of, or you know. It was mean. For example, Nada Tavada in the Lada Watashada is a, a great fun phrase to say. Perhaps I should sing it from the rooftops. Nada Tavada in the Lada Watashada. Um, but it actually means, what a shame, he's got a small penis. <coughs> Probably shouldn't yell that too loudly. As lesbians, this may confuse our neighbours. As time went on, the Polari language eventually emerged from secrecy and made its way into mainstream media. Round the Horn In the mid to late 1960s, a comedy sketch show series ran the BBC called Round the Horn. The show starred two actors, Kenneth Williams and Hugh Paddock, who played two Polari-speaking characters, Julian and Sandy. The show was designed for families and played on Sunday afternoons, so the Polari they used was a more palatable version, simplified to be more accessible to a wider British audience. At first, non-speakers would have assumed it was just gibberish, but as phrases re occurred, they started to get to grips with its meaning. Whilst it was a family show, Williams and Paddock took advantage of the opportunity to bring in front of millions of 1960s Brits to push the boundaries of risque. They would insert more saucy references unbeknown to the non-Polari speaking scriptwriters. For example, they'd make jokes about dirty dishes. Remember what is that a dish means? Here's the dish cloth. We can wash up in here. All the dishes are dirty. Speak for yourself. Oh, shit. <laughs> This would have gone over the heads of many listeners, but as gay culture started to shift towards a more out and proud approach, it was an important step in introducing the LGBTQ plus community into mainstream media in a positive light, which had rarely happened before. Why did Polari decline? However, speaking Polari on one of the most popular mediums of entertainment at the time did sort of ruin the secret. The show put Polari on the map for the first time, which ironically just resulted in it falling into oblivion. The popularity of the radio show meant that a language that was previously kept hush hush and spoken only with an underrepresented group suddenly had a nationwide platform, leaving the omni Polonies who'd relied on this means of communication exposed. However, the 1970s also saw a significant shift in gay culture. Younger gay men were becoming increasingly frustrated by sneaking around, being forced into a subculture and stereotyped as camp. The likes of David Bowie, whilst hugely influential for showing fluidity and expression on an international stage, didn't help in the aim to squash the stereotype. 
but this era was also seeing an increasing number of gay men in traditionally masculine settings, such as gay rodeo in the US, which put a bigger spotlight on non-stereotypical gay men. Polari, being a language that was primarily used in the performing arts world with all its camp and innuendo-based words, was, they felt, perpetuating a stereotype and therefore deemed outdated. Plus, the camp nature of the two Polari-speaking characters, Julian and Sandy on Round the Horn, only emphasised that notion further, and so Polari started to be associated with archaic attitudes towards homosexuality rather than with progression. Moreover, whilst homosexuality was obviously still stigmatised in the late half of the 20th century, its decriminalisation in 1967 did help in reducing the risk of harm to the LGBTQ community. Acceptance of homosexuality was starting to develop, and so there was a reduced necessity to talking so secretly. With the LGBTQ community pushing to be more understood in society, a separate lexicon that segregated them became detrimental to the cause. It was no longer so necessary or cool to be communicating in secret. Instead, this new trend was to attend pride parades and be out and proud. Polari now. As you might expect, Polari isn't much spoken today. Not for the purpose of keeping your identity a secret, anyway. Most gay men would have never even heard of it now, but there are still stories of the odd word being used here and there by folks who grew up around it. I am tempted to bring a few words into my own vocabulary. I could call Claudia a dizzy poloni, which means scatterbrained woman, which, um, I mean, particularly useful as she really does have a lot of baby brain at the moment, but you know, less useful because it describes me all the time. David Bowie brought the language back again recently just before he died in his final album, Black Star, where his song Girl Loves Me included Polari lyrics. Perhaps no surprise given he was a young music icon in the British gay scene in the 60s. Lyrics included real bad dizzy snatch making all the ommies mad, which fans and linguists have loosely translated as naughty little airhead driving all the men mad because yes, David Bowie's sexuality is debated by everyone who ever knew him but not the way that you think and I'm pretty sure someone's going to have a fascinating anecdote to leave in the comments. Although it's not spoken anymore, Polari still holds historical significance, both linguistically and as an important component of LGBTQ history in the UK. From a linguistic point of view, it's a fascinating case study into how language can evolve in the faces of oppression, and for LGBTQ community, it reflects the level of discrimination they face and the grave necessity to hide, which mustn't be forgotten. Even if nobody uses Polari now, it should certainly be documented and researched more thoroughly. Fundamentally though, Polari shows that it doesn't matter how much you ostracise a group, discriminating against them, pass laws against their favour, there will always be a way for underrepresented groups to find a community, camaraderie and a means for their culture to survive and prosper. Thank you so much for watching today's video. If you enjoyed it, please share with a friend. Let me know in the comments down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you next time. Remember, I make videos every Friday and alternate Tuesdays, unless I am on maternity leave, in which case it is a pre-recorded video every other week because I have to feed the YouTube algorithm beast, so ta-ra ducky! Mwah. Today's question from a Calgon Fairzard club member is from Marina. How do you feel about renting a Christmas tree? Had absolutely no idea what renting a Christmas tree was, but I have now Googled it. So thank you for bringing this into my life, Arena. Apparently, you can rent a Christmas tree, give it back to the farm, and they just put it back in the ground, grow it a bit more, and then next Christmas, give it to someone else. This is an absolute genius concept, and I'm definitely going to be looking into it next year.